Okay, so I would like to start with this same uh, session that we had made previously. So again, the easiest way to start with the session here, and you'll see mine, it's a little bit confusing because mine's actually, uh, um, uh, I've had this around for a while. Every time you upgrade to a new version of Capture One, when you open it in a new version, you'll actually get a warning that'll say, do you, if you've, if you've um, processed any files in, in an older version. So let's say I'm going from version 12 to version 20. Don't ask me why they ignored all of the teens in the middle, but they did. Um, if I've already created a session and worked with it in, in version 12, and then I go to open it in version 20, um, you'll get a warning saying, okay, you need to upgrade this to, to work in the new version. And what they're doing is, is that they're only giving you a new preference file. So in terms of your captures and all of that kind of stuff, you do not need to worry about access to that. You will still have all access to that. It doesn't change any of those things. All it does is change this preference file. And so if you do this long enough, you'll end up with like, you can end up with a, uh, five, 10 of these preference files and they all refer to previous versions of Capture One. Typically the newest one will be the one that doesn't have backup labeled in it, but you can never count on that. So anyway, the reason, the easiest way to launch Capture One is to actually double click on the session file preference. So again, not in the capture folder output selects or trash it's this preference file right here you can see i've got two backups i'm hoping that those are both referring to earlier versions of capture one and that this one that doesn't have backup in it is actually the one that will work for capture 120 and yes indeed that isn't that's exactly what happened so if you double click on that it launches it and it brings it in and this is actually then the folder that we've been working with earlier now I'm gonna go back to my library. Again, the tabs that are at the very top on the right, on the left-hand side at the very top, library is the one all the way to the left. Uh, if you don't see any folders now, a lot of times it will be because you've got something else that's not selected other than your capture folder. Make sure that your capture folder is selected. And then also you need to look at the filters that are existing down here in all of the searches down here. If for some reason you had a search active when you actually last did this, then you're gonna have a limited number of files that you're able to see. So the easiest way to get rid of your search or any possible search that's going on, you'll see in the search dialog box, there's a little circle with an X in it. If you click on that, it will actually undo any searches that you have and then your capture folder will show you the complete uh, uh, collection of, of, of images that you have in here. Once you get back to that version, you need to then look up on our thumbnails part. So has everybody got this open? Are we all good on this part? All right. If you take a look though up at the, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, the very top of your thumbnails part, there is, again, there is an eyeball, then there's an up and down arrow, and then there's something in the middle, a number in the middle. The number in the middle, I think, is the uh, actual uh, uh, thumbnail count. But I wanna click on the eyeball that's up at the very top. You wanna actually, in my case, I don't want the thumbnail complete set. What I want are the single thumbnails only. So again, if you click on the eyeball, there's a drop down menu. You have three icons. You wanna pick the one that's furthest to the right. That should be, in my opinion, that should be your standard. Uh, unless you are trying to edit big sets of contact sheets. Uh, most people don't work that way because the, contact, the uh, thumbnails are too small to really be able to edit with them. So anyway, that's the one I'm gonna click on. And then in the up and down arrow, this is the sort order that you're actually using for your thumbnails. Um, and in the thumbnail part, if you click on name, it should, if you've actually done your naming convention correctly as you've been shooting along, it should be in order. So you'll see, you should, in my case right now, I've got frame 23 followed by frame 22. So this is now in the reverse order. So if you go back to that same double headed arrow up at the very top, you'll see that there is a check mark next to the reverse. So what this is saying is, is that we're going to sort your thumbnails by name, but we're gonna do it in reverse order. So if you uncheck that reverse and then go back and take a look at your name, you'll see that instead of having that dash next to a name, it's just a check mark and then there is no check mark against your, uh, uh, the reverse part. And then you can actually take a look at this and you'll see there's some files that I brought in from an earlier shooting, but then ultimately when we get to the ones that are outside in the parking lot that no longer, no, this parking lot does still exist. This is parking, no, this is the parking lot where they just built that brand new building, yes. 
Yeah. Wait, what happened? So is everybody able to open this? Okay. Alex was not because this was actually created, or the versions, maybe one of his is corrupted, but he's got version 20 on this computer. He can't open this because this was created in version 21. He just keeps getting an error. What does he do? What would you do as a digital tech? Do what? Exactly, exactly. You just simply create a brand new session and then drag your files into it. So I want everybody to do this with me so that we can all figure out how to do this part. So let's say things don't move. So this is what you would uh, ultimately do. We're gonna come over to the little drop down menu. This is where I do it from. Again, you can click on this little plus and do new session, not a new catalog, or you can do it up in the file menu, down to new file menu, down to new session, either way new session and then we're going to name it and what you really want to do is you want to name it after the session that we're trying to do right here i'm just going to call mine we'll call it i'm going to put it in a different place so that we can do it but or call it version two but again i'm trying to recreate this session so i don't want to change the name of the session so the original session that i'm looking up here was two zero two zero zero so two zero two zero zero four two one underscore CCC underscore C1 Pro demo. And then I'm going to do mine with a two just so that I can keep it separate from the other ones. Then where do you put this? Exactly. So I'm going to click on this thing underneath it, open this up, and say I want this to be in my pictures folder alone. I'm going to choose that folder. Then I'm going to check everything else. Everybody else here is looking pretty good. And I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. And then we need to navigate to your finder. So in your finder, I bring up two windows typically. So I've got one window that I'm going to set up here at the top. And I'm going to make it half of my screen. And then I'm going to grab another window and also set it up uh, and make it the bottom half of my screen. And the reason I do this, and it's just a good habit to get into, it's a safe habit to get into. I only copy from top to down. I never do it in the other direction. I only copy from top to down. And the reason this becomes important is, is that if you always then open windows at the top that are your originals that you can't afford to fuck up, then you'll never fuck them up. You'll never overwrite them. You'll never throw away the wrong file. You'll never do the wrong thing, whatever. So anyway, I've got now this original Capture One working profile. It's sitting right up here at the very top. This is the version. Now, in this case, I've got all of my captures are actually in here. They're all sitting right here. So this is the original. So this would be the corrupted folder that Alex cannot open. This would be the corrupted version of it. Then I'm going to go down here to the bottom version, uh, the bottom f a window that I've got open, into my pictures folder, and I'm going to find the one that I just created. It should be at the very bottom of your screen. 
And mine is not at the very bottom of my screen. So what I'm going to do to find this in the very bottom of my screen, I use the column version view of this. I know a lot of you guys do um, icons. Nobody uses icons because you can't find shit quickly. So anyway, if you want to change yours, it's this drop down part right here. It would be the column part right here. Again, this is a list. This is icons. This is, I don't know what view. Anyway, so I do the column view. Then click on the drop down icon next to this and you can say, I want you to show it to me by name or the last date added. So for me, date added, this is the one I just built. And so at the very top, this is the one that I'm looking for right here. It's just a fast way to get there. Open up in the capture folder and then grab all of your captures from your old one. So I'm just gonna grab all of these. I'm gonna copy them to mine. So I'm gonna bring it down here on top of this Hold down the Option key on a Macintosh and you'll get a little plus icon. That's saying you're not moving them, you're copying them. And I'm going to go ahead and copy all of them. And then I'm going to go back into my Capture One, click on my Capture folder, and they should all be right there. Did that work for you, Alex? OK, perfect. If you want to go back to your original one up here again in the library, you now have a drop down menu right here that is all of your previous sessions. If you want to go back, in your case, Alex, you don't want to go back because yours was corrupt. But for the rest of you, if you want to get back to the original one, you can simply come down. These will actually always remember your last 10 versions of this unless you actually click on this clear menu. But I can come back to the original set that I did and it will reload my original set. And that's what I'm gonna go back to because I'm gonna to wanna to continue working on that part. I'm gonna throw away that second set that I made later on. Is this clear for everybody what we just did here? Is there any questions about this? We good? Uh, okay. So we've gone through, uh, again, how to make sessions. We went through catalogs briefly last time, or did we not get to catalogs at all? We didn't do catalog and importing into catalogs. We didn't do that part at all. Okay, that's fine. We did get through filters, didn't we? And we did get through session albums or session favorites. Again, we got through all of this, five star, four star, building your own. We got through all of that part, right? Okay, then again, over here on the top, that drop down menu will give you your sort order right here. So just to give you guys a sense of how most people work in Capture One, and this is how I work in it as well, you can change the size of your thumbnails. To actually change the size of your thumbnail, there's a two-fitting uh, dialog part right here. You'll see at the very top of your screen, there's a fit something up here. I'm gonna click on an image just to get something on there, on this image. If you click on this slider and start to move it forward, it will impact, if it works, It'll impact the, the, uh, uh, the preview, the viewer. It doesn't change the size of your, uh, uh, of, of your thumbnails at all. Your thumbnails are not going to have a, th a slider for them uh, um, because you've told it using this icon that I just told you to go to. Again, the eyeball down to the icon that's all the way over to the right. It makes your thumbnail as large as you can have it given the space that you have to work with. So again, right now, I have three up that I'm actually able to work with here. Typically on a monitor, like one of the uh, iMacs that you guys are working on, that kind of stuff. Again, if you want to change the size, you can actually change the um, a width of, of your thumbnails over here. So I would make mine, so again, on a, on a laptop, you can do like four images right here. If you go to a monitor, you can do five. The reason you want to do this is that when you've got an art director, or yourself for that matter, that are actually editing this stuff, if we go down to the part where we start here uh, on, the, uh, on the shots that were taken out in the parking lot, if we start at this place right here, if you were thinking about wanting to edit this, what you want to do is, as you go through this, typically what people will do is an art director or a photographer will go through, and they'll take a look at this group here and they will do anything that they want, anything that they like will get a single star. So I'm gonna click on this top one. And then again, you do not want to use your up and down arrow keys because if you have multiple columns of thumbnails, you will skip any of the thumbnails that are to the right or to the left of the one that you're currently on. So you use your 
left and right arrows instead, then that way you don't ever have to worry about it. Anyway, they'll click and they'll drop down like this, and again, they'll just hit all the ones that they like are one stars, all that they like are two stars, all that kind of stuff. But once that's actually happened, once that process has actually happened, I'm actually gonna come over here to my four star, or my five stars, I've got five of them, hopefully you have the same number. Go ahead and click on that five. So now you're, let's just say, you've got your so you've gone through it a second time and a third time and you've elevated stuff as it is it, you know oh, i still like that one i still like this one i still like this one you reach the point where you really want to then be able to see these things uh, um, uh, um, side by side so that you can make a decision so what i would do is i would select my top frame hold down your shift key and select the bottom frame and you will get thumbnails of all four now, if you can't do that, it's because you do not have multi-view selected. So if you take a look on the right, I'm sorry, the left side of your, uh, um, uh, uh, the top of your uh, options bar, there's a thing that looks like, well, again, it's four images or it's four little icons. You need to make sure that that guy's actually checked. Now, the things that are next to it are proofing margins uh, and mask of visibility. Mar you don't need to worry about any of these. Nobody uses any of these things here. Again, this would be only for processing regardless. Uh, but nonetheless, if you don't have this thing checked, you don't get these multiple images. However, the problem now is that let's say that you've gone through this and you've are, okay, you say, okay, the one that I like the very best is I'm actually going to uh, pick this very first one. It's got a red tag on it right now, but I'm gonna click and drop down and say, this is gonna be a green tag on this. This is one that I really like. I wanna promote this. However, none of my other images in here, I feel like I wanna promote. I don't, they're, they're, not all, they're no longer in the running for being a, a final image for me. The problem that I've got now though is Shit, hang on, let me go back up one. So I'm gonna do it, it's these four images right now. The problem that I have though is that there's still another image that I haven't seen. But if you start to simply start to scroll down like this, you are going to lose track of what thumbnails you've actually previewed and what ones you haven't. So instead of doing that, if you just hover your cursor down underneath the bottom of the scroll bar and click once, it will go to the whole next grouping of four. And then you go through those again. Does that make sense, what I'm talking about doing here? So it's just a way of assuring that you get to see these bigger previews. However, does everybody have four of these up? Okay, if you hold down your space bar and you double click on one of them, it will zoom you in to that one image alone and double click on it, it will zoom you back out if you continue to hold your spacebar, no matter what tool, I've got the actually the white balance tool selected right now, but if I hold down the spacebar, I get the hand. This will allow you, if this image was zoomed in, well here, so I'm gonna double click to zoom in. Again, hold down the spacebar, you can get the hand, you can move around here to see other things. If you double click uh, the spacebar again, it will zoom back out. However, I've got four images selected. If you add the shift key and the space bar, so now I'm holding both of them down, the shift key and the space bar. Now when I double click on this, everybody zooms in. Double click again, everybody zooms out. Double click again, everybody zooms in, still holding down the shift key. Now I can move, all of the images will move together. So this is if you're shooting something, especially in the studio, and you want to zoom in and move around, again, if it's been on a tripod and all of your frames are the same, whatever, this will allow you to move around and everybody will move around. But let's say right now that, okay, well, I've got a card in this top image, but I don't really see it in the bottom image. I've got part of one in the other image. Let go of your shift key and then you can actually space individual ones so that you get cards in every one. There's not a card in this one top image. But does this make sense what's going on here? It's just an extremely fast way to navigate. And again, once that's done, hold down the shift key, space bar, double click, and everybody zips back out. Are we good on this part as well? Yeah. I'm sorry, if there's what? If you want to do what even more? Zoom in bigger. Oh, zoom in even bigger. It's this thing right up here. So I'm going to zoom in. So I'm going to hold down my space bar, double click and zoom in. It will bring you into 100%, but this thing up at the very top will allow you to go in even further. So if you click on the little plus or use the slider, 
but click on the plus, everybody moves in, and you get bigger, and you can go all the way up to like 500%, 1,000%. You can zoom in pretty tight. Uh, okay, questions about any of this? Are we good? All right. Um, to get back out of this, this is a tricky one, and a lot of people don't ever figure this one out. If I don't want to see any of these again, I want to start something new. These have all been selected. To deselect something, if you click on the outside here in the viewer panel, nothing happens. If you click on an image, I've got my white balance tool selected. It actually white balances the image. It selects it, but it white balances it. But I've still got everybody selected. You'll see the heavier uh, white line goes around the one that you've actually got active, the one that you're really working on. But you've still got the smaller white line around all of the others. So I'm going to Command Z because I didn't want to change the white balance of that. To start over or to deselect all of these, you need to come over to your thumbnails. You cannot select on the area underneath your thumbnails because that'll change your rating. You can't select on the name because that'll actually change the name. You simply want to click next to a thumbnail without clicking on it. So look at, see my screen. I'm to the side of this. Click once and it deselects everybody. And then you can click on one to start the whole process again. Make sense? All right. Have we gone through preferences here? Did we go through Capture One preferences about any of this really quickly? Did we go through that last time? All right, time to do it right now. So up to the Capture One window, down to either preferences, depending on what version of Macintosh or Windows that you're on, or settings, it will be changed. So uh, all newer versions of Mac OS are settings. Preferences is the ones that they've had forever. So I wanna go through these again really quickly just to make sure everybody's on the right page about this. If we click on general, all of this has, uh, there's really no reason to uh, uh, change really anything about this. Um, uh, you don't need to worry about anything in here. The only thing that you would possibly want to change in this is that if you are used to putting in a, a CF card or any sort of, you know, if you've been shooting to card and you want to import that to a different program than Capture One, this is set up to actually open uh, when, when you actually plug in a card from a digital camera. It's actually set up to open uh, uh, Capture One. If you don't want that behavior, click on this to turn it off. You can always still uh, uh, import into Capture One whether this thing is on or not. So nothing else in this first part do we really care about here in terms of doing this. Again, this whole process of backing up and notifications, you don't care about having any of that being done in a program. You want to actually have your own backup schedule that you are maintaining for your entire computer, not something that just one uh, 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 program would actually be generating. If we click on appearance, the appearance right here, this will actually, this is the sort of UI look of all of this. I leave this all at its, um, uh, um, uh, at, at its defaults. We have, I think, looked at compare variants. If we haven't, we will look at them again. But this orange color for compare variants, a really smart thing to have. So I, I just leave this at its defaults right now. If you click on image, the next one over, this is something that we will get into later on. But what we, what, what, if you take a look at the very top of this, this thing that's called EIP, what EIP is Capture One's version of a DNG. So what it will do is with an EIP, so well you guys know this, if you're shooting a Canon, you're shooting to, you're just shooting to uh, Capture One, whatever, and it generates CR2 files, raw files, right? And if you make any adjustment on that CR2 file, it creates a sidecar file, an XMP file. Everybody's from, is anybody not familiar with that process? Questionable about that process? I think you're lying to me. So I'm going to come into a folder and I am, again, this is a inside a capture folder, but I'm just gonna double click on this CR2 file. You guys don't need to do this, just watch my screen. Uh, I'm just gonna launch a CR2 file because mine is set up to launch into a uh, Photoshop. But you'll notice there's no file along uh, uh, next to this guy. There's no, there's just, just this CR2 file that's got this, um, I'm picking up frame number 14. So I'm just going to do this right now. This is a raw file, and again, you can, how, what program in here can you use to edit a raw file? Anyone else? You're all wrong. 
you cannot edit a raw file. You can process a raw file, but you cannot edit a raw file. There is no program that will allow you to do that. So some of you have heard this story before, but this is important to know because this drives this whole thing, this whole conversation. When Adobe, who's created the raw, so every single raw file in the world, doesn't matter what camera manufacturer it is, every single one is a flavor of a TIFF file created by Adobe. Adobe created TIFF. TIFF stands for Tagged Information File Format. And it's basically, uh, uh, again, it's a raw file, but Canon licensed the TIFF format from Adobe, and then Adobe allows them to put in uh, what they call a special header. It's a special thing in the file that makes it a Canon file. Then they did the same thing with Nikon. And so all Nikon files are unique to Nikon because of this special thing they add. But all of them are TIFF files that have been created by Adobe. All of them are licensed by Adobe. So when Adobe created this thing, um, it was at the very beginning of the stage, very beginning of digital capture, very beginning of digital cameras, and Adobe was really on this because, again, it was a money maker for them. They saw the, you know, the future of digital cameras. They wanted to put film out of place. However, the one stumbling block they got into was um, law enforcement. Law enforcement said, well, there's absolutely no way we're touching digital capture because anybody can go in there and fake shit. I can go in there and put, you know, Paige's head on Judas' body at the murder scene uh, and all of a sudden, Paige is the one that gets arrested for the murder that Judith did. And they said, we're not touching that. So Adobe came back to them and said, okay, we'll tell you what we'll do. We will create a closed system for raw files. And what we'll do is, is that if anybody manages to get inside a raw file and changes anything in the raw file, it will destroy the file. The file will be no longer operable. It will no longer be openable. So you cannot, there's nothing made, not even illegal shit that is made that will allow you to edit a raw file because if you do edit it, you destroy the file. So instead, so then everybody said, well, that's great, but now I can't process, I can't do dick with this file, right? You can. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to simply change this. So I'm going to do a minus one stop on this. I'm going to just make this change and I'm going to go ahead and just click done. I'm just going to say, okay. I've done this, I've accepted this, I've made a change, but now look what happens right back here. See this thing right here called XMP? This is a text file that actually has exactly what I just did to this. So everybody watch this. Again, you don't need to do this, but watch what happens here. I'm gonna actually open this thing with a text editor. It is a text file, that's all it is. So I'm going to open it with a text editor. And what you'll see is this really daunting list of stuff that goes on through all of this. This is all the XMP data, that's everything that's in here. But you can see right down here that in my, this is all about my lens here. This is the color temperature. This is the whole white balance. But see this thing right here that says exposure 2010 equals minus one. That is the minus one that I just did. Watch what happens. I'm gonna change this now to a minus four and then I'm going to save this file and I'm going to close it up and then I'm going to double click on that CR2 file again. Again, you can't edit that CR2 file, but that XMP file, this is now the minus four that I just changed in that text file. The two of these have to go together if you want to maintain any adjustments. So. The way Adobe gets around this is they created this thing called DNG. Everybody in here is familiar with DNG, right? What a DNG is, is a folder that has the raw file in it plus the XMP file in it, and then they disguise it to make it look like it's just a single file. But it has the raw data in it plus this XMP data. Does that make sense to everyone? Are we good on this part? So back in Capture One, I'm gonna hit Done on this. Back in Capture One, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna quit Photoshop because I don't have those kind of resources. 
Uh, oh, here, check this out. I've just quit Photoshop. I'm gonna throw away this XMP. Remember, when I opened it up, it was a minus four exposure. I'm gonna get rid of this guy and open up my Capture One, I mean, open up my CR2 file in Photoshop again. And you'll see I've gone back to my defaults because there is nothing left to tell it how I wanted it processed. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, so in Capture One, where we were looking at these in this pack as EIP, this is a DNG for Capture One. So if you wanted to give somebody your raw files without giving them the entire session, because remember, in a session, if we take a look at our session, so everybody go to your capture folder in sessions, hold down your control key, click on the drop down menu and say, show this to me in the finder page. Sorry, I don't know what they call it in Windows. Did they say show it in, in files or something like that? If we go take a look at this thing in files, whatever, this comes into, so remember, these are our session parts that we've got going right here. So you can see, if you give somebody the whole session, there are these other folders that are inside of this. So if you're in your capture folder, scroll all the way down to the bottom, see this capture one folder down here? These are all your XMP settings that you've got. So again, they don't treat it the way Adobe treats it by creating an XMP file and putting it right next to the raw file. They create this folder right here. And if you take a look inside this folder, you'll see that you've got these COS files. If we take a look at another version of this, these are all the different versions of the ones that I've actually done in here. But these COS files are your XMP files but it's XMP in the Capture One Phase One vernacular. Does that make sense, everybody? So back in here in our preferences in Capture One, this EIP, what they do is they go find that file, that, that sidecar file is what they call it. They take the raw file that you've got, the sidecar file, they put it together into a single file and that single file has all of your XMP data as well as the raw, but it is together. And that way you could give somebody just that one EIP file and it will have all of the adjustments that you've made to it in Capture One as well as the raw data. Does that make sense, everyone, what's going on? So this matters because if you've done a huge amount of adjusting on your stuff and you send this stuff to a client and you don't give them all of the session or you don't create an EIP file here, they don't have any of the work that you've done. All they have is your raw data. Is that a problem? You as a client, would that be a problem? Somebody sends you, it's like sending you a JPEG and nothing else. We good on this part? All right, moving over, capture folder. How many of you guys have been tripped up by this? What happened, Paige? So you guys struggle with tethering in Capture One. Everybody struggles with it. Um, it's better than it used to be, but never, nonetheless, everybody struggles with it. So the biggest problem in the beginning was every camera maker has their own flavor of USB. They create drivers for this, uh, for these cameras. And so all of these have to be built into Capture One. So it used to be in the older days that when you would run into these confusions, you could go in and you could turn off support for every camera except for the one that you're using. I've got a phase one camera that's on right here. If I'm running into serious problems, I can't get it to tether, I can't get it to tether, I can't get it to tether, you can come in here and you can turn off the support for every single one of these other cameras so that there is no USB confusion and only leave the support for phase one on. The problem is that, well, number one, you need to restart Capture One in order for this to take effect. But number two, this is sticky. So if nobody knows about this and they go in now and they connect a Canon camera to this and this is how my camera, this is how my Capture One is set up, there's nothing in the world you will ever do that will get Phase One to recognize or Capture One to recognize the Canon camera because you've told it you don't want to support Canon cameras. So as a troubleshooter, this is the first place you go. 
Make sense? So I'm going to turn all of these back on. Um, next thing over, color. In terms of color here, you don't really need to worry about these parts. Even though they have uh, the ability to select a rendering intent here, by definition, all ICC color support supports ev all four possible rendering intents. They are built in by default. The only reason you get to pick one here is it's that what will be the default when you're actually looking at an image inside of Capture One. It's not to say that you can't change this after the fact. So you don't need to worry about anything that's going on in here. The color wheel layouts, this will have more to do with color adjustments. We use the standard one here. You can see the color wheel isn't any different. It's just been rotated. Um, this standard model is the one you're going to run into all the time. This is the one that actually has red at 3 o'clock. So red in hue is defined as 0 degrees, and that is established as 3 o'clock. So this is really the one you're going to run into in the U.S. at least anyway. The next one over, exposure. If you click on that, you definitely want to change your exposure warning down to 250. Why? Yes, bail him out right now, Paige. It is page white. So what I really care about in looking at an image, now I will change this occasionally. I will change this occasionally. So what I'm looking for here is, is that I want to know, again, 250 is the limit where I'm going to have highlight detail. It doesn't mean that I won't, don't want things in my image that, that don't have any detail that are pure white. And there's a lot of times that I do want that especially shooting in the studio. I want a pure white background. Well, that's 255, that's not 250. I don't want detail in it. This will allow you to actually target that. So I leave mine as my standard is 250. And the reason I do that is that then it'll flag anything that I, if I need to worry about, all of a sudden if I see I'm shooting fashion, white t-shirt, these are classic, white t-shirt, and all of a sudden I'll see red on the white t-shirt. That's an indication that even though my color card is within that 245 to 250 range. That white t-shirt may not be. That white t-shirt may actually be whiter than the white patch that's actually on my card. So this will actually flag it for me and then I can say, okay, I've really got to change my exposure here to make sure that I'm capturing all the detail in my uh, uh, white outfit. Does that make sense, everyone? By default, shadow warning is not turned on. You need to click on it to turn it on and then I set mine at 15. 15 is a good place if you're actually looking to, because what this will do is this will show you anything that's going to fall below shadow detail on screen. If you're worried about print, then you need to change this. You need to kick this up to like a, uh, a 25, somewhere in this. We've talked about mid ranges. We've, have we looked at targets on this stuff at the print, how we established this 245 to 250? I don't think I have it here the print that's got the grayscale on it. Yeah, I know we've looked at that in certain classes. I'm just not sure in this one. But at any rate, this is how I would actually set this up. These things actually matter. I'm going to kick this back down to a, two, uh, to a 15 here. So this is my sort of standard go-to at this part. The next one over for crops. I don't know about you guys, but when I crop something, I hate just seeing little crop outlines but then see the whole rest of the image. It's really hard for me to compose a crop that way, right? So for me, I prefer to have my crops be where my edges are completely black. To do that, the default of this, if we click on the defaults of this, you'll see it's set to a 50 opacity. So what that'll do is it'll ghost back your image. My brightness is also set at zero. So if I go in and crop something here, well, I'll show you. You don't need to do this, but watch my crop. I'm just going to throw a crop on this really quickly where this is set. You can see you get this ghosted out area here. I don't like seeing it like this. This is really hard for me to judge my crop on this. So instead, I come up to preferences. In my cropping uh, preferences right here, watch what happens to my image right here. This like ghosted part back here. If you take your opacity all the way up to 100%, this thing becomes jet black. I prefer that. I also like black cropping. Some people prefer white croppings if you do that click on this brightness slider and drag it all the way up and you'll have a white cropping instead. Why does this matter? Because you've got a picky ass art director who's saying, I don't want to see black borders on this. I want to see white borders. And you look at them and say, well, sorry, I don't know how to do that. Guess who isn't coming to work the next day in that studio? Guess who's never going to work in that studio ever again, right? 
because you're just like, oh, I'm sorry, man. Sorry, man. I, man. I fell asleep when Versa was going over that part, and I don't know how to do that shit. Anyway, I'm going to kick it back to defaults, crank it all the way up to 100%, because this is how I like mine. There's other things that are going on in here. See these readouts that you've got in here? This is actually sizes and pixels, these readouts. So the cropping, you can actually say in here, when do you want to see a frame around this? So again, you have options here. You can say, I always want to see this, or I only want this when there is no mask present. You can change the labels. These are the labels right here, the sizes of these, the pixel dimensions of these. Do you want to see those always? Do you only want to see them when I'm doing my drag or you're doing this? I never want to see these things. So if you're a kind of person that really likes to you know, read this out and say, oh yeah, that's eight and a half by 11, or this is uh, you know, 10, 000, or 1,066 pixels by 1,600, whatever. This again, you can change this part. Uh, and then the show handles part in here, you can have them always on where they show. You can say, okay, I'd want to turn them off when you're actually dragging, or I don't ever want to see these things. So you can control all of this. If you click this on its default and then grab this opacity all the way up, this is how I set mine. It's up to you how you guys like to do that. In the focus preferencing right here, you have a focus check in Photoshop. I'll I mean, in Capture One, I'll show you where this is. It'll actually go in and it'll analyze your image and it will give you a color. In this case, it's a color of green and it will show you this green color, what it believes to be in focus in your image. How on earth is it figuring that out? This throws everyone. So the way it figures focus out is, is that it looks for the greatest amount of contrast that is in your image. Because theoretically, something that is in focus has the most contrasty edges to it. And it separates itself from what's right next to it because that's what would be in focus. If something is blurred and out of focus, those edges are much, much, much softer. So what it, this is really doing is it's picking up contrast. Now you can come in and control these things. I don't know anybody who's ever gone in and changed these things because nobody knows what the fuck these things are supposed to mean. So, but the standard does a pretty good job of it. So anyway, that's where I'm gonna leave mine at its defaults. And then finally, if we go to warnings right here, this can give you all the warnings in the world you'll ever wanna know about what's going on. So tell me when, warn me when I'm moving images from catalogs and folders and catalogs and all this stuff. Again, by default, these are all on. I'm a big believer in warnings. If I'm getting ready to do something stupid, please tell me. You'll see there's two little double-headed arrows that are right next to this. This indicates that there's more to this screen. So again, if you click on this, the only thing we're missing here is plugins. If we click on plugins, this will actually show you the options of plugins that you can have. Now, there is support. So for instance, I know that the uh, NIC filters are supported here in Capture One. That would be considered a plugin, and you can actually come in and, 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 and load this stuff here. I don't really know anybody who really exploits this a whole lot, so uh, I'm just going to leave this as it is right now. If there's some reason that you've got a photographer or creative that's really into a certain specific plugin, it's really up to them to let you know that. Uh, and then update, we skipped over this one as well. Update is like, how often do you want to check for updates? This is all about Capture One. These, uh, how many of you guys have actually gotten warnings when you actually launch Capture, you put in Capture One, and it'll come up and say, this is a brand new camera. Do you, do you want me to uh, register this camera, right? You're not registering the serial number of this camera with phase one. What you're doing is, is that you're registering this camera with the program that's on whatever computer that you're on. There's no real advantage to doing this. I, it's just how it is. So again, so for me, this is really all about, I think, giving them a way to uh, warn you all the time that there's another uh, uh, update for Capture One and you should give us a bunch of money to pay for that. All right, questions about any of this? Are we good? Okay, hang on one second, let me see. This to me strikes me as a really good time for a break. I'm gonna call this 210, make this a hard 10, be back at 20 after and we will Jump into this again. Paige, you can steam for 10 minutes. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm just wondering if I'm going to get a mid, uh, mid format camera. With yes. The battery, uh, base mount or hot plug. So, um, in I'm, I'm not talking about this. Uh, okay. Back at it.
Oh, so really quickly, how do you get rid of crops? So two things can actually happen here. So if you click on the crop tool up the very top, so everybody do this with me. This will actually be a good one here. Uh, let me get rid of this for just one second. Uh, okay, so if you select the crop tool, so again, come up to the tools that are very in the very top of the options bar. It's the one that looks like uh, it's like two L bars that are crossing uh, across each other. It's actually an uh, old device that people use to actually physically crop stuff uh, uh, to sort of like create borders. Uh, anyway, that's what this icon is supposed to be about. Um, <clears throat> if you click on this tool, you'll actually see there's a drop down menu and to begin with it does an unconstrained crop which just means you get the little handles around the outside and you can click and bring these in and you can make it any sort of shape that you uh, ultimately want it to have. A lot of times what will happen with Capture One is you'll see is I'm starting to get this tool part smaller and smaller and smaller that gives me a horizontal crop right there. If I want this crop to be the same, but I want it to be a vertical crop, if you come up here, it does it automatically for you. It's just a question of how you ultimately crop this guy. But once you get a crop set up like this, you'll notice that you just get the crop handles around it and nothing else changes. However, if you click on any other tool, so I'm gonna go back to the white balance tool. If you click on this, it actually does the crop for you. you it actually goes ahead and crops it and then resizes the image so that it fills up your viewer. If you go back to the crop tool, it goes, it shrinks back down again and you get the crop handles again. But this is the most frustrating thing about the crop tool in phase one. And again, if you don't know how to do this, this just goes to show that you don't know what you're doing. To get rid of this crop, you actually come, you bring your crop tool outside of the frame. So this is image area that's up in here, outside of the frame. You see, I get the little plus, click once and it just does a one pixel crop that then goes away and this thing expands all the way back out again. The problem that you run into is this. I'm gonna make my crop smaller again and then I'm gonna come up here to the top and I'm going to click, but I'm not going to, it's not gonna be a perfect click. It's going to be a slight movement in this and that happens to me. And as you then go through another image and you take a look at another image, which is I'm gonna do right here, I'm just gonna go back to my normal uh, white balance tool. But when I go to this image right here, it looks blank. And sometimes you can't even see this little thing right here, down here. This is a cropped image. So if you go back to the crop, you may see it as just a blank. So I'm gonna go back to the crop tool and again, try to get the little cross somewhere that's outside of the image click once and it'll bring the entire image back. However, sometimes this simply will not work. Uh, for some reason it's cropped, you can't get it to done, so I need everybody to do this thing with me. So if you've got a cropped image and you cannot uncrop it, what you want to do is you want to create a version of this file that has no adjustments on it at all. To do that, hover over the thumbnail that you've got this crop on, hold down your control key or a right mouse click or a double finger swipe on your trackpad, click on this, you get a drop down menu. Again, and we talked about this in the beginning, phase one exploits or capture one exploits the hell out of these drop down menus. This is where you do your renaming, your batch renaming, all of that kind of stuff happens all here. But in this case, if you take a look up at the top, you can see that there is a new variant and a clone variant. What variants are, are copies. They are copies of your raw file, although they don't make a real, they don't make an actual copy of the raw data. All they do is they take the raw data and they make a reference to it. The same thing happens in, um, uh, um, uh, in Lightroom. I forget what they call them in Lightroom. But you can have the same image in Lightroom processed different ways. You can, you can have the same frame and you can have one of them is black and white, one of them is a color, one of them is highly saturated, one of them, you can have multiple versions of that same, multiple processes of that same thing. That happens here in Capture One as well, but they call it variants in here. So if I click on the thing that says clone variant, what clone variant will do, go ahead and click on it, you'll see. What clone variant do is it will make an exact duplicate of what you have. 
So uh, you'll notice over here now I've got two thumbnails. One is named number one, one is named number two. These are the exact same raw file, but what's happened on the second one is, or I've made a second copy of it, um, I can now change these. So I could come in here, for instance, and say, okay, I'm gonna do this one in black and white. So I'm going to go to, you guys don't need to do this, but I'm gonna do it. Uh, I'm not going to do black and white. I'm just going to do a real hardcore shift in color. Okay, so now this is no longer exactly the clone, but does that make sense what we've got going on in here? These are exactly the same file. I'm going to click my second one, and I'm just, just going to hit the delete key to get rid of it. It doesn't get rid of my first one, but you see that number one goes away because I don't have a second variant. So that's clone variant. What clone does is it, it copies all of the adjustments, cropping, color, exposure, anything that you've done processing wise, all of that is copied in a clone variant. However, if instead you do your control click on this and you do new variant, it will create a new variant of this image that does not have anything actually done to it. And I'm looking for where my new variant actually, oh, my new variant doesn't have any, um, uh, um, uh, it's got no uh, uh, five-star rating. And this is actually, I'm actually asking this thing to only show me five-star ratings. So I'm gonna go back into my uh, uh, library and my sessions. I'm gonna clear all of the search part. And then I'm gonna go down to that number 12. And here it is right here. So you can see, I created a brand new variant of this. So this is the one that has the crop on it that I can't get rid of. This is the one that has nothing on it. So again, I'm going to go up to my top one here and hit the delete key, and now I've got an uncropped version. Yes. So this is actually a lens correction file. So what you can do here, and most camera software does this, you can do this in Canon software. Nobody uses Canon software, nobody uses Nikon software, but they actually have this built into them and they're really strong to do. But basically what this allows you to do is you take a, as a matter of fact, it may even be in this case, in the medium format camera case, you know the cleaner box that I told nobody to ever use? There's this piece of plastic in it. So what you can do, and again, all camera software, Adobe does not make this feature into it because it would cost, it would, it's probably too problematic for them to create support for it for every single camera body that they support. But in software that's dedicated, again, it's Canon, builds it into theirs. But what you do with this is that you take this piece of plastic you put it in front of your camera and you create an exposure that actually gives you, this is not a pure white. So something around a 245, 250, it's very light, but not a pure white. What will end up happening is, is that any dust that is on your sensor will show up as dark spots on this white background. Well, if you've got dust on your sensor, if you don't clean your sensor, that dust never moves. So it's in the same place. So if you go in right now, we go into the studio and I'm going to do a shooting in the studio, right? And I do one of these frames. So I put this in the front, I shoot the picture, I've gotten a frame and all of the sensor dust shows up. If you create this LCC, what it is is it actually is a map of the sensor dust that is on your camera. And then the software will automatically go in and clone that sensor spots, that dust out on every image that you take that you use this to apply to it. So that's why there's a create one and then there's a, an apply one. Because again, the thing is that the dust never moves on your sensor. It's always in the same spot. So even though you may be moving around in your camera, your subject is changing, your background's changing, all of your content is changing, but the sensor placement never changes. So if you've actually got a map of it, then it will automatically get rid of that. Again, some people use this, some people don't. If you're a wedding shooter, I would definitely have this enabled, right? Because who wants to go in and actually spot a thousand pictures? This allows you to do it automatically. Okay, so anyway, are we good on clone variant and new variant in here? Everybody straight on that part? 
Uh, okay, and then pack is EPI. Again, we can do that part. We all we know what that is. Again, as well, it's going to sort of create the EIP version of these files. So instead of it being a TIFF file, um, that would be what uh, the extension that Phase uses for their backs. Um, it, again, it's their DNG version. Uh, okay. Alrighty. So I feel like we've gotten through this part pretty well. However, I do want to create a new catalog right now and talk about how we can import uh, into a new catalog really quickly just so that you guys have gone through that exercise. Again, I don't know anybody who really uses, I do know people that they'll do a combination of phase uh, uh, of sessions in Capture One and Lightroom uh, to catalog their stuff. Uh, I'm sure there are people who actually use catalogs for this, but uh, uh, again, in a, catalogs in a commercial setting don't make any sense unless you are shooting always for the exact same client. That would be the only reason to ever do it. And even then, it doesn't make sense. For me, the people who actually use catalogs would be more like fine art photographers who are keeping a collection of everything that they ever shot in one place or uh, uh, something like that. So uh, again, I don't find a reason for them, but you should know about them. So if we create a new catalog for this, again, come up to the little plus icon. Uh, we're in the library panel. Click on little plus, come down and say new catalog. And we're going to name the new catalog the exact same thing that we've named everything else. So um, 20204221 underscore CCC underscore uh, C1 Pro Demo. Uh, and don't put this in your pictures folder because I don't want it to overwrite what we've already got in there. Go ahead and we're just going to throw this on the desktop. Again, I've told you never to shoot to the desktop um, because, again, that desktop database has to rewrite every time it, anything on it changes. So if you're shooting tethered every single time a photograph goes into your capture folder in this catalog or anything, a session that's on, on your desktop, whatever, the entire database for your uh, desktop has to rewrite itself. So it's not just changing one entry, it changes every single thing that is on your desktop. Uh, so anyway, and let's not look at anybody's desktops right now because you guys all have way too much shit on your desktop. Okay. Okay. <laughs> just saying, just it's the truth. Um, I've got a toss folder for me, so I'm gonna actually put my catalog in my toss folder. I'm gonna hit choose on that and then go ahead and say create and you'll Create, and then you'll see here, it just opens up. There's nothing in this catalog right now except for this big sign that says import images. If you've already got a catalog going and this isn't up here right here, you can always get to import by using this little dialog button that's at the very top of your window all the way on the left-hand side. You can also get to it from the file menu. You can do an import here from the file menu, click on import images. So that's basically how you would import stuff. We are going to go ahead and import images into our catalog right now. So click on the import button and it's going to say, okay, where? from where and you can see up at the very top this is a little more intuitive i think than the way you do it in lightroom but nonetheless this is where it exists so i am going to import from i'm going to click on this drop down menu and say i want to choose where to import this from typically if you haven't gotten something else to sh to turn on automatically when you open up or when you insert a, a cf card um, if you've left this preference setting that I just showed you guys in Capture One to actually open to launch Capture One when you insert a CF card, then this is where you'll end up right here. But if not, you can actually navigate to this. So in my case, I'm thinking this is actually in the right spot. So yes, this is the exact one. So this is the, so the other folder that I gave you on your working files, uh, uh, on the, uh, again, the Capture One working files, there was another folder in here called, you know, fake uh, uh, Capture One flashcard imitation because we don't have flashcards here. So this is, will just give us the experience of doing this part. So again, I'm going to say, yep, this is the one that I want to use. So click it open. You'll notice that there are check marks on all of these, so everything is checked to actually go ahead and import. If you look down at the very bottom, you can see that there's a button that says import all. 
You don't have to import all. If you uncheck this pick all, it will actually uncheck everybody and then you can go through and pick cherry pick these things one at a time. So let's say I only want every other frame. I can pick every other frame and then you'll notice the import button changes to select three images to import and I'm going to say yeah, that's what I want to import. I don't want to do all. Or you can click on pick all again and it will actually flag everybody. There's only 10 images in here so it shouldn't take us that long to actually bring this part in. So we're good on this. However, Typically when you're coming in from a CF card, it's actually got the naming convention that your camera imposes on it. So usually it's an IMG underscore and then some number. Those things don't mean anything to us. So what we want to do about all of this is that you need to decide exactly what and how and where you want to import this stuff. So when you're doing a CF card, you can actually import into the catalog. That will bring your raw data into the catalog as well as the catalog will maintain all the database, all the sorting functions, all the namings, all, the, all that kind of stuff will be named in a database. But this is actually saying when you have here import to add to catalog, it's actually saying I want you to bring these raw files into the catalog as well. And what will end up happening is that the catalog will just continue to grow. It means that you're keeping every single raw image that you've ever shot or imported in your catalog on your computer and eventually you're going to run out of space. So most people do not use this. Most people would actually say, uh, uh, this will say add to catalog or copy into catalog. Add to catalog does not bring the raw data in, sorry, that's what copy does. But uh, um, uh, uh, add to catalog will just do the reference to it and it will leave your images where they are, which is on a CF card. You don't want to do that. You actually want to have a dedicated folder, usually on an external hard drive. So you would actually pick this, pick this copy to folder, and then it's going to say, okay, what folder do you want to do this on? And I'm going to plug in my external hard drive really quickly so that we have an option to pick. Yes. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we're going to talk about strategies for that right uh, in just a little bit. You, um, so I always say that you should be shooting to the hard drive that's uh, inside of your laptop. The only reason that is is that because the bus that actually lets the, the connects your computer to that storage, it's the fastest that there is. You can't get a faster storage uh, uh, setup in there than the one that's built in, right? So it's the quickest. So there's the least lag when you when you're shooting tethered. So if you know it's trying to write those files tethered, there's the least amount of lag if you shoot to the uh, uh, hard drive that's on the inside. But you never want to store your shit there. Once your session is over or periodically throughout your session, you want to copy all of this to an external hard drive. And then once you actually make a backup of your external hard drive, so you don't need to worry about losing anything, then you can throw the one, uh, the session away that's actually on your internal hard drive. Okay, makes sense? And then once it's on your external hard drive, uh, the editing process is not that markably faster on an on a internal. You don't have to copy it. If you wanted to go in and do some color work, you don't need to copy your session back onto your internal hard drive. You can run that on an external hard drive. It's really the tethered part that makes the not shooting directly to an external hard drive so important. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, so anyway, I would set something in here as my import folder. So I would uh, create a new folder in here, say set this as my import folder, and I would be good to go on that. So I'm going to cancel out of this right now. Instead, I'm going to change this back to add to catalog instead of copying. So it says right here, your files are going to stay where they are. Again, not something you want to do on a CF card, but nonetheless, you get where this is going. By default, it's going to throw it into a collection. We've only got a set of sort of collections that are the defaults right here. You'll see there's an all images, there's a recent import, a recent captures. You can shoot tethered into a catalog and then trash right here. Um, I'm going to just leave this at its default so that the collection, it's just a reference to this. It's not, it's not changing anything. Nobody uses backup in automatic here. Again, this is... Um, there's a liability in trying to have your software actually do your backing up for you because certain things happen. And the most notorious one is that in Lightroom, how many of you guys, whenever you close Lightroom, it says, do you want to back up Lightroom right now? 
and you'll say, oh, no, skip this till next week or skip to next time. You guys all have had that happen, right? Do you know that's not backing up a single one of your image files? All of that's backing up is the database that's in Lightroom. Your image files are still vulnerable. So this to me is a problematic thing. This is actually saying backup enabled. I don't want to use this. I don't use it in Lightroom and I don't use it here as well. In the naming convention right here, if you drop open this naming convention, you can actually change how this all of this stuff is actually named. So we can have a job name in here. Again, a three digit counter. This is typically the way I name all my files when I'm shooting tethered. So again you can change this if you want to use some other convention you would simply click on the little three dots and it brings you right back into the you guys already know this naming dialog box from uh, actually setting it up in capture one we've gone through this haven't we okay that's what i thought here so i'm going to go ahead and cancel out of that part right here the naming the metadata this is at its most simple all you really have here is a copyright um, tag that you can actually fill in uh, and a description again this would be specific um, if you want a greater more in-depth version of metadata to be embedded we create a style for that and then use that as an import um, we will get to styles later we won't even get to styles today that's what's going on right down here in all of this part right here um, if you'll notice as you come down here that there's no file info there's no name there's no nothing in here it's because you've not selected any of these photographs if you click on a photograph it will actually give you all the information that it has that you're actually looking at and then after import down here I use this drop down menu to say tell me when this is done now other people will actually have this uh, to open the collection when the import actually starts or to never touch anything to never do anything I like it to just notify me when it's actually done so if you're importing 5,000 files and it's going to take an hour to do it you can go work on something else and then all of a sudden this window will pop up and say your import is actually done so this is how I'm going to leave mine set up like this part right here. So then I'm going to move this back over again and I'm going to say import all. And it'll go through a little part that's actually happening up in here. And this is the notice that I get. The import completed successfully. And I'm going to say, oh, OK, great. Well, take me there. I want to see this import. And here it is. And you'll see. It's not under captures anymore. That doesn't exist in a catalog scenario. It's only these imports. And everything that happens into your catalog is all about being able to search for stuff. Because again, if you do this correctly, you use one catalog for your whole life and every single thing that you shoot goes into that catalog so conceivably you'll end up with a catalog that's got hundreds of thousands of images in it and you need to be able to search for those images so keywording becomes really important we haven't talked about keywording and all this kind of stuff yet but anyway that all of those things become critical when you're doing this kind of work so that you can then go back and search stuff so do not postpone this part. If you are using catalogs and you want to do imports, immediately if you take a look up at your screen, there's a little icon with a circle on it and an eye in the middle. This is your metadata version of this. And if you take a look, this is where your keywording would actually happen. So you can come down and do keywords here and you would type in, in this case, you know, girl, studio, pink background, Barbie look, you know, all the keywording that you would use for all of this so that 10 years from now when you're looking for these images you'll say oh i remember it was the time of barbie and i was doing a barbie knockoff so you would do the search for keyword barbie and all of these things would show up make sense okay so to get out of this again come back to your library icon all the way on the left hand side at the top click on you can go back and forth now between sessions and catalogs so if you click on this drop down uh, uh, image right here we can actually go back to the original session that we had going on here that doesn't have any of the import here at all so we're back into our original session you can import into sessions as well you don't have to only import into a catalog so import into a session you would do the exact same thing i've got a session open right here i'm going to take a look all the way down here at the bottom and let's say that i wanted to i was shooting a tethered out on the uh, in the parking lot like i'm doing right now so i'm shooting tethered everything's going well but then all of a sudden the client says to me um, i want to do tracking shots well what are tracking shots and how do you do them that's what i'm saying to you guys what is a tracking shot 
So what a real tracking shot is, is that let's say you've got somebody walking down the street and you want to shoot them walking down the street, right? You walk with them, right? So the worst of cases, and again, you will hear this on the video, you will not see this, but this will be my demonstration. Um, I'll even do it with a camera. So this is the most classic tracking shot. So one of you guys is just gonna start walking to me. So just imagine Jo Bella stands up, she's gonna start walking my way, and I'm shooting like this, and I'm trying to walk backwards like this, and I'm shooting the whole time. That's a tracking shot. Now, walking backwards, holding a $40,000 camera is a very dangerous thing to do. So what do you do as the consummate tech or assistant to make sure I don't fuck this up? Say what? Exactly, Alex, you're the photographer, come here. Hold this camera. Joe Bell is gonna be walking at us right here. You're gonna be doing this, start to walk backwards. And I am controlling him the whole time he's walking backwards. He does not have to worry about tripping something, bumping into something, stepping off a curb. He didn't worry about that because I'm literally guiding him backwards and making sure that he's okay. If he does stumble or trip, I'm there to actually catch him. Again, that kind of stuff is just major. However, that is a pain in the ass to actually do that, right? You get bounce when you're doing that because you're, again, every step that you take, your body's moving up and down. It's just, it's not the way to do good tracking shots. So what's your next move? How many people in here are skateboarders? Oh yeah, you sit down on a skateboarder and you have an assistant drag you back. That's a great tracking shot. What's the best tracking shot that you can possibly do if you're staying in a really nice hotel in any really good city in the world? You get one of their wheelchairs that they have. They have multiple wheelchairs and you take that on location. And again, you're sitting in your wheelchair and you have an assistant dragging you backwards. How about a radio flyer? Anybody here know what a radio flyer is? Wagon. You bet you a little wagon, right? That also works great. How about a luggage cart at a hotel? That also works great. You guys getting the idea here? I work, I actually rent things called doorway dollies. They're actually steerable versions. Um, if somebody reminds me during our next break, I'll try to find a picture of me in a doorway dolly. Um, but I did them all over New York. I was a classic. I've got a hundred pictures of me in every part of New York City with shooting on doorway with a doorway dolly. But they're designed to do exactly what we're talking about. That's what tracking shots actually are. And if I could remember why I got on this whole tracking shot thing, I would. Oh, so we're at this part right here. I remember we're at this part right here. So I've been shooting these stills in this parking lot the whole time. And all of a sudden I've got an art director who says, OK, I really want to do a tracking shot. And I say, OK, it's really difficult, not impossible, but it's harder to do tethered capture when you're actually doing tracking shots because you've got to put your uh, your computer has got to be riding with you in the cart. And that's all possible. Um, but usually what people will do is that they'll then they'll go to a CF card. So you put a card into your camera. You've already been shooting, so you know what your exposure is. You've already got your color balance. You've got your color card. You've got all the stuff that you need to actually do it. You just don't want to be doing it tethered. So you put a CF card into your camera. You format in your camera. When do you format your cards? I've got a never. Never's actually an option. It's an ex, it's an ex, no. It's an expensive option, but never's an option because that means that you you use your card once and then that's it, and then you always have it. But you always have it. What were you going to say? Bingo. That is exactly correct. You format your card when you have to, not any other reason, right? So you always, it will, so whatever is on it, as long as you can find it, will still be there. So it acts, it's not a great backup, but it's a backup nonetheless, right? Um, so you only format when you need the card again. How do you format? Can you put a, actually a card reader in your computer, throw a card in and format it in your computer? Well, you can. Is that a good idea? No, it is a horrible idea. Formatting is actually camera specific. It gets really specific. There are people who, and I, I, I'm one of them, who uh, I've got um, the camera, the 35 millimeter camera system that I use. I have a 5D Mark III and a 5D Mark IV. 
I would never trade one card into the other, even though they're both Canon models, even though they're both 5D series. I would never do one that I'd formatted in a three and a four. So a lot of people will tag their cards with the serial number, the camera that it's supposed to be in, or just in my case, it's I've only got those two cameras. So it's they're tagged as either Mark, um, Mark three or Mark four. Um, and you don't ever mix that stuff up ever. And God knows you do not ever take a card that was formatted in a Nikon and throw it into a Canon and reformat in a Canon. Good luck. Again, you are just asking for a problem you don't want. So I'm shooting to card. So now I want to actually import this card into this, but I want it to be a part of my whole session. So if I come down to the very last frame that I've got here, so I need everybody to do this with me because this is how we're going to trick this out. I need to continue it as if I had shot this tethered. That means I'm going to have to rename this stuff, right? So I'm going to do an import button. So click on your import button. We're again, we're back in the session that we were. It knows where the last import. So it's no, it, it picked my fake imitation card here. So go ahead and uh, uh, um, uh, um, if, you, if you don't have this part, again, come down to choose folder and then navigate to that uh, uh, flash imitation card. Uh, I would always check exclude duplicates because it'll go in and it'll actually look at a lot of the metadata and if it detects a duplicate, it will change that for you. Then the destination for here, this is set up to my capture folder. Now, which capture folder is this? Well, if you've done 100,000 sessions on your computer, are you sure that this thing is going into the capture folder for the session that we are working in? Or is this going into the session that I did two months ago or two years ago, right? To check, hover over this little arrow, and if you hover over it, it will show you where it's actually going. It is in my pictures folder, in that folder, the exact one that I know. So this is indeed the one it's supposed to be in. You can also click on this arrow and it will take you to that folder and you can see where it is. And you can say, yep, again, this is exactly the session that I'm talking about doing here. So it's going to the right destination. This gives you the, part, the path to it. This showed uh, space left. This part's important because if you've got a CF card that's, let's say, got a terabyte of data on it, and you say, yeah, I want to import it, and it turns out that you've only got 34 gigabytes available, you will crash your computer. You'll crash something because you're trying to import three times the data of space you have to do it. Again, that's why it's here. I'm not going to back this up to anything. I am going to check the naming uh, convention on this. And you'll see here that it's actually set up to do the job name. Well, it knows the job name of my session. This part, it's again, the session part's right underneath this. Let me hide everybody else. The session is right underneath this. It knows what the session name is. So it plugs that in and you can see it's sitting right here. This part is correct. However, in you're looking at your uh, Campbell, uh, this, this part as well. It's actually gone in and it's found that I've got frame number one through 23 has already been shot. Remember, if we move this out of the way, this is frame number 23 right here. So it knows to start this at frame number 24. But if it didn't, if this was saying, oh, frame number one or frame number uh, uh, 58 or I mean, something else in here, Again, you would actually click on these little three dots at the top, not the renaming part, but the three dots that are right across from the naming uh, label. Click on this and then you can set your import counter to whatever you would want this to be. In our case, 24 is what we want this to be because that's the next frame in the series. Does this make sense to everybody? Remember as well is that the sample that you get here is a live readout. It's not just a sample. This will tell you exactly what the name next frame is going to actually be named. So I know that I'm in good, uh, uh, I'm in good shape right here. All of these are actually picked. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on import all. It'll go through the whole process. It'll say, yep, that was successful. I'm gonna scroll down and take a look at this and you can see these have now been renamed. Their naming order is also, uh, uh, is, is also um, uh, um, uh, been you know, um, respected. So, uh, and we're good to go. Questions about any of this? All righty, we got through all of that. 
Shoot. When are we going to shoot outside? When are we going to shoot outside? In a couple of weeks. Uh, it's like session 13, I think, or 12 or 13. Why? Because today we got best weather in the year. Oh, I know, best weather in the year, except there's too many clouds. Uh, okay. Uh, we talked about star ratings. We talked about color ratings. We've talked about all of that kind of stuff, right? I just want to make sure that we're checking on here. We got through albums. We got through sharing sessions. We got through catalogs. Blah, 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 blah. All of that. Oh. Yeah. Okay. We are in luck. All right, we're going to start in the camera tab really quickly right here. Hopefully, we'll get through by like around 3.30, whatever. We'll take another break. We'll see. But I need everybody to hook a camera up to their capture session. You don't need, no, just a, any camera. Yes. Oh, you just never let them fall. No. Are you shooting film or digital? Do you have a sample of it? Let's take a look at your sample. Because when you say dust, I'm not really sure what that means. Yeah, that may be true. But you should be seeing that on anything. But I'll show you how you can actually see uh, if there's dust on your sensor and how you can check. You, you, well, yeah, but you want some tone in it because if you shoot, if you overexpose your image, it will actually, the, it'll flare around the dust spots that are on your sensor and you'll never see them. So you need to make sure it's more, it's like a very light gray is the exposure you want, not a white. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to reset my, uh, again, I'm going to ask everybody to do this part as well. If you've got, does anybody in here uh, got a custom setup yet right now for their uh, workspace? So if you do, if you had like added stuff, you know, you added tools, like you added black and white to your camera layer or to your, uh, anywhere, if you added, did any of those adjustment things, if you come up to your window menu and come down to workspace, you can actually save custom workspaces. So you'll see I've got a Verser tethered workspace, a Verser toss workspace. I've got a couple of workspaces here. Uh, I've got older workspaces that were designed for older versions of Capture One. Um, there are built-in spaces here. Have we looked at this window yet? Okay, because I thought we talked about doing dual monitor. This is how you do dual monitor here if you've got a client and you yourself. So what goes on the second monitor? Would it be the browser, which are the thumbnails over here, or the viewer, which is the big guy right here? Typically, you set this up as a dual space here. Sorry. A dual space here, large viewer, and the second of your monitors goes to your client, and you keep the large browser uh, or everything else, all of the workspace for yourself, so your client's only looking at the final images or only looking at the really big screen. Uh, and then if you need to do more people on that, so typically when I shoot anymore, there is a digital tech who's sitting at a station like Alex is sitting right here, and um, there's a creative art director who's sitting right next to him and there's twin monitors. So Alex is working on his monitor. He's got all the controls here, all of this setup, all of everything that's happening here, he's got all of that is setting here. The client or the creative art director, or whatever, has got strictly a monitor that shows nothing but this view right here. 
But then me as a photographer, I'm typically further away. I'm sitting on the floor, whatever. I have a monitor that's next to me that shows me everything that my digital tech is seeing. But then also there'll be a fourth monitor that's actually really close to the model so that the stylist can actually see what's happening on the monitor and is in really close to the, to, um, uh, to, the, to the model that's being actually photographed. So to get four monitors to actually show this, what you do is you come into Apple Preferences down to System Preferences and then in displays, you can set up each one of those displays. They will all four be showing up here and you can have the stylist's monitor is mirroring what the creative is looking at. So it's images only. And then what I'm looking at is mirrored to what the digital tech is actually seeing so that I can see everything on it. I can see my ISO, I can see my naming convention, I can see everything else. Does that make sense, everybody, how you actually trick these out? And you can expand from there. I mean, you can actually have, depending on the resources that you have in your computer, unlimited control um, uh, on, in terms of the number of monitors. Uh, okay, so at any rate, if you want to save, if you've got a window setup that you really like and you want to save it, because I'm going to tell you to go to a default setup right now, come up to your window, come over to Workspace, and just do Save and just name it after yourself, and this will be your custom workspace. But otherwise, I want everybody to de pick Default Workspace. Um, and then this will actually show you how uh, cameras, uh, uh, the original camera one actually comes. So some of you guys actually use exposure evaluation. I do not use exposure evaluation. I am reading numbers on my images. I don't ever use exposure evaluation. It's an okay thing to use. It gives you basically a histogram. But again, I, you know, if you go into a studio and you shoot on a white background, you'll have a gigantic amount of your histogram will be all at the white point. And then, so it'll look like something wrong. Uh, in situations like this. This does not look like a well-established uh, 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 um, uh, histogram here, but what is wrong with my exposure? Fucking nothing. My exposure is perfect. If you take a look up at, there's a color card in one of these, this color card that's right here. I'm actually going to hold down my space bar. You can do this with me. Double click to zoom in to the image. It's got the color card in it. Pick your white balance, so use your drop down, make sure that it is white balance and not anything else in here. Click on the white patch that's right next to the red. The reason I use that is that again, you don't want a white balance on a white, even though that seems like a contradiction of terms. It's because the white doesn't have any flexibility in terms of where it can actually make a curve adjustment for color, because this white is all too close. If you think about a histogram that's in Photoshop, this white here is up very close to that top upper right-hand corner. There's no maneuverability up there. So again, something that's more down in the middle is where I would actually pick. So this has now actually been white balanced. If you want to now apply this white balance to the other images that were shot, again, I don't want to use it to apply to any of the white balance that was on the street because the stuff that's on the street is a different lighting scenario than the stuff that was in the studio. So I'm going to zip back out because I actually have white balanced this. However, I need to then copy and apply this adjustment to all of the other images that were in the studio. So to do that, if you take a look up at your uh, uh, options bar that are sitting up at the very top, it does not show up here at the beginning, but you see these two little headed arrows that are sitting right here. If you click on that, you will actually see that there is one tool that is, uh, two tools that are missing. There's an edit selected tool and a copy and apply. If you click on this copy and apply, it should bring you over and I'm not getting over there, and that's pissing me off. So I'm going to move my copy and apply. So to edit this top part up here at the very top, hover over it. So I'm gonna edit this entire work, all the tools that are sitting up here at the very top. I'm gonna to hover over here at the very top. I'm gonna to hold down my control key and click and come down and say, customize my toolbar. I'm gonna to get rid of, see these things right here? These are spacers. I don't need this. I don't need this spacer right here. I'm gonna click and drag and get rid of it. So now that just brought in my edit selected part. So I like that part. I've also got a div division right here. I'm gonna grab that guy and pull it out. 
I don't have anything that's happening in here, but I do have another spacer over here. I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm also going to get rid of this spacer over here. And now I've got my copy and applies are actually visible to me right now. So then I can just say OK to that. So I'm going to then say done. And now I've got this copy and apply. So if I click, you'll notice that the copy arrow, the up arrow is actually uh, highlighted, not highlighted, but it's, it's uh, light. And then the down is dark. And the reason the down is dark is because there's nothing that has been loaded on the adjustment clipboard. Adjustment clipboard is something that's used throughout Capture One, so you need to get used to this. So again, it's not like applying metadata is, and you remember in Lightroom, it's like they'll say, oh, sync settings or sync all of that. You don't have that here in Capture One. What you have is this. So if you click on the up arrow, so I've got this selected that I applied that custom white balance to. If you click on this, this is now actually copied everything about this image. If I had done an exposure adjustment, it would copy that. If I've done any color adjustments, if I've done a style adjustment, if I've done anything on this, it copies all of those. If I've done cropping, it'll copy that. So it copies all of those, and then I'm gonna select the rest of my images, the ones that need to be white balanced. I just selected the first one. I'm holding down the shift key now and selecting the last one, and then click on the down arrow, which is apply those adjustments and you'll see that it'll run through and everybody should actually be then color corrected but it does not look like that's actually happening or it's happening really slow yes So if you only want to do the color temperature settings, then we go into color temperature. Let me just see if I can get the rest of this to work first. Hang on. So I'm going to hit copy again on that. Select everybody else and hold down my shift key and say paste. Did the apply work for you guys? No. It did? Yeah. Huh. All right, I'm going to show you the next trick here because this is something I use more than I use this copy and paste part. So again, we are going to re-edit this control bar up at the very top. Hold on your control key. Click on this so you get the drop-down menu. Get to custom uh, uh, customize toolbar. I'm going to get rid of my auto adjust because I never use it. Um, I'm going to leave everybody else. Oh, I've got another uh, option right here, another separator here. I'm going to get rid of. I'm just buying room up here. I've got a big separator right here that I can buy if I need it. But then I'm going to look. There's a version of copy and apply that's all one right here. See where this says copy and apply? I'm going to click on this and bring this up right next to my dedicated copy and apply and say done. And now what happens is, is that if you've got a pro sorry. If you have a primary photograph like this, so again, I'm going to select this guy. This is my primary photograph that's sitting right here. <clears throat> you can see I've got all of the other ones are selected. So I would come in onto my primary photograph. It's not selected, so hang on one second. I'm trying to deselect everybody. So I'm going to select on this one. I'm going to hold down my shift key and select all of the others. So now they're all selected. Uh, I'm going to then on this primary one, I'm going to zoom in and do my white balance. There. And then simply click on this copy and apply. This will like copy the active frame that's got the big white border around it and copy it, those adjustments to everybody else. So hopefully that'll work. This will actually open up. And so this answers your question. How do you only copy color balance? If I've done a ton of other things on here, well, here, let's do actually something else on here so you can see. So I'm going to hit cancel out of here for just one second. I'm going to change the exposure on this as well really fast. So I'm just going to do a plus one or plus eight, five on here. And then again, I'm going to come back to copy and apply. You'll notice now that it actually has all of the possible things that I could be copying and applying. These would be all the adjustments that I could make. The only two that have been made are white balance right here and exposure. I only want to copy the white balance to everybody else. So I'm going to uncheck exposure 
and then merely apply and the only thing that will get applied will be white balance and now everybody has been white balanced it's a much more effective way of doing it make sense okay also while we're on this at the very top you'll see that there's a undo up here this undo redo undo redo impacts everything that you do to an image so if i click on this undo right up here for my first image let me zoom back here on this guy remember i've color balanced this but i've also changed the exposure on this if i click on this undo it will remove the exposure shift and it'll also remove the color if i only want to do them separately though i can actually do that see you've got the very same thing down here in the exposure part so take a look this return arrow right here if i click on this it only redoes the exposure part my color part has not been changed i'm going to hit command z to undo that to bring it back if i click on the same arrow for white balance it will actually undo the white balance but not my exposure and then finally if i click on the one at the very top up here to reset it does everything make sense all right i'm going to go ahead and reset color and then I'm going to go back to the camera part so anyway back on the camera part here I don't care about exposure evaluation so for me and my custom version of this I don't have enough room on this thing to actually do what I want to do so on this I'm going to get rid of this so I'm going to control click on this exposure evaluation tool come down and say remove tool and I'm going to remove this exposure evaluation in my camera drop down menu you definitely want this but you'll see in my camera evaluation right here or my camera setup right here all I have is ISO why is that I'm not tethered to my camera I'm tethered to a digital back it has no idea the only thing I can change in this software is the ISO because that's the only thing the digital back has my shutter speeds and aperture are all in my camera and this is not talking to my camera you guys with a Canon setup get to change all of that shit right however what is important about this is to remember that your IQ this thing right here should be sh showing you that you're shooting to raw uh, if you're not if this says JPEG, you know You actually need to go in and change the settings on your camera so that you are shooting raw This white balance tool right here not only will set the white balance It's the same as this tool right here with one exception if you pick the white balance tool. It's up here What happens with this is that for phase backs only if you use this tool to actually set your color balance it will then not only set the color balance for everything that you're shooting it will upload the color balance into your digital back and your digital back will then apply it during the tethered part so your tethering will be slightly faster this is also where you have live preview is sitting right here uh, if you click on live preview you'll sort of see what it ends up doing it'll actually open up <clears throat> It doesn't work really well, I, I think, on these leaf backs. Uh, these leaf backs are an older technology, but on your version, it actually should work reasonably well. But this is how a whole lot of people will actually go in and do composition. So they'll do a live photo. I'm going to actually pan up on this so you guys can sort of see what's going on. So let's say that this screen really was my uh, set in the studio. This would allow me to actually move shit around on my screen and to actually watch it happen in real time. It's nowhere near as responsive as it is on the Canon cameras, the CMOS cameras here. But one of the things to remember about this is, is that when you are in live view, you cannot actually make a capture. Even though I've got camera controls right here, you cannot really do a, 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 a capture in this. You've got to exit live view before you can really start shooting tethered. The other thing that you need to know about this is that uh, even though it would appear that it should be this way, you cannot shoot a video in Capture One. You cannot do live. You can do video with Canon cameras, but you cannot with a, you can't do anything any of that work in Capture One. Capture One is not a motion capture uh, a, a medium. So anyway, I'm going to click out of this to get rid of that live view. It closes up my camera again. We're going to continue on down here. So I keep camera in here. Camera focus, if you open this up, this only works with high-end, most recently 
uh, phase one cameras. This does not support camera focus anywhere else, but in uh, really high-end phase bodies, this does support camera focus. But again, I'm set up, I'm tethered to my digital back, not to the camera, so none of this control exists for me, so I'm going to get rid of it. And this does not, camera focus does not work on any 35 millimeter camera, so it doesn't function for, um, um, for your Canon cameras, your Nikon cameras, so it's just taking up space, get rid of it. The next one down, camera settings. It is the same thing right here. This is only taking a look. It's a, a giving you the ability to actually change settings in this. It's in my digital back. All I can really do in here is, it's got a predetermined white balance for flashes in here. This is an ICC profile, that's all it is. This would be my file format. If you click on a drop down menu, you guys need to look at this for me because this matters only in phase. You don't really have the same, you do have kind of the same thing in other cameras, but right here I've got an IQL and an, an IIQL and an IIQS. So what the IQL is, is that that's actually phases um, uh, raw extension is IIQ. Every now and then it'll actually be labeled as TIF instead. Uh, but anyway, it's still the raw extension for phase. This IQL is the full frame version of a raw file. This IQS is the small version of that. So what happens in the small version, and this also happens in Canon. So if anybody you guys ever set a Canon camera to a different raw other than its standard raw, Everybody who's got a Canon camera right now, go into your menu setting. I'm going to look at yours right there so I can see it with yours. Go into your menu setting. Go to the very first. Okay, then let's go look at this camera over here. Come over really quick, Alex. Don't look at your camera. It'll be what it is. What do you mean by that? I'm going to show you right here. All right, so is everybody looking at their uh, camera? So you need to go to the image quality menu. It's the red menu all the way to the left hand side in the menu settings, and it's, it's number one. So, I'm sorry, here. So it's the number one out of those. Can everybody find it where you actually see the image quality? Then click on the set button to go into the image setting and you will notice at the very top, you'll have two rows if you're on a 5D Mark II, or Mark III or Mark IV. You'll have two rows. You'll have a raw row at the very top, gives you raw settings, and you'll have a JPEG setting at the bottom. You can actually set your camera to shoot both raw and JPEG at the same time. So if you do that, if you, again, a lot of uh, um, um, uh, newspaper photographers will shoot that way. So that they have a smaller, really quick process version of the file that they can send out really fast, but they're also capturing their raw as a backup. But at any rate, the top frames work using the wheel that's by your shutter release. The bottom one, the JPEGs, are the wheel that's at the very back. So if you set the JPEG all the way to the little dash on the left-hand side, that means you're not going to capture any JPEG at all. But on the top one, if you go to raw, that's actually the typical CR2 file. But then you'll see you've got an M raw and you've got an S raw. M raw is a smaller version. It is still a raw file, but it is a smaller version of it. And then S raw is an even smaller one still. You just word to the wise right here. If you shoot M or S raw and a Canon either one, the only program that can read this is Canon software. Adobe cannot read this. Capture One cannot read this. So be really careful about that. I don't know anybody who uses these things, but nonetheless, that's what that's all about. So in this case, it's the same. Uh, uh, Capture uh, 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 <coughs> Camera Raw, all Adobe products can read this large format IIQ uh, uh, for phase one, but they can't read the small version. Um, so just be aware of this. Also, the small version has got, what the way they actually work these out is, is that for the large version, it copies the information for every single pixel. 
For the smaller version, what it does is it does four pixels square and it averages those together and creates what we call a super pixel. Then what happens in the Canon that goes even smaller is, is it takes one of those super pixels, it does four of them around and creates a super, super pixel. But again, you end up with, a, in the first case, uh, you end up with a quarter of the resolution. And in the second case, you end up with a 16th of the resolution. So they're smaller, but they're not really where you want to go. Okay. So anyway, that's what's going on in here. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and leave this, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, all the, the readout that I've got here in my camera settings. I'm going to go ahead and leave that part. Naming capture, we've already gone through this and had it. Everybody's comfortable with naming capture, right? Okay, so again, when I do my tethered shooting, we're going to change this a little bit. So in my tethered shooting, I'm going to edit my uh, three digit. So if you're just using, if you're not using uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, session favorites, dedicated folders, you would just, this would be your naming convention right here. So I want everybody to come up to their file format. Make sure that you've got the name underscore three digit counter. Has everybody got that set? Okay, you can create presets with this. So come down, click on this menu to come down and you can do save custom preset and you would actually want to call this, again, I named this after myself so it's easier for me to find, but you could also just name this name plus three digit, whatever. And if you save this, then you don't have to rebuild these naming conventions every time you go in here. You simply pick the preset. However, we're going to change this because of the way we're going to end up shooting in here. I'm going to delete that three digit counter and then I'm going to come down to my tokens down here. This is what they call these things. And I'm going to grab this destination folder name. And I'm going to drag that up here instead. Then I'm going to add another underscore. If you're doing this with me, you'll remember this. If not, this is going to come right out of your mind the minute we go on break in 10 minutes. Drag the three digit counter up now, click on the drop down menu and say three digit. Now look at your actually uh, the readout right here. Now, because my capture folder is what I'm dedicating this to, it fills in the destination folder as capture. But when I go to actually adding shot numbers for this shooting, this is going to change. But this is how I do my naming. Is everybody good with this part? Are we any questions about this part? Are we comfortable with this? What don't you get? No, no problem. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, again, you can save this as another preset. So I'm going to come up here and do custom preset, and I would just call this Verser Destination Folder. Say save. And then in my presets down here, you can see I've got my naming one convention, which is just the three digit counter or the destination folder, which is the whole other thing right here. Presets are a really good thing to actually have. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to this. I'm going to leave my destination folder in there. Next capture location. If you actually drop this down, all of this should be showing is that where it's actually going. Now with this destination part selected, then the reason they have brought this destination folder here is that it means you don't have to go back into the library and reset another one of your favorites as the destination folder. It allows you to simply do it from right here. Again, it also tells you how much room you've actually got left on your hard drive and roughly the number of captures that you've got. So you can see right here that with the available space I've got on my computer, I can do roughly 650 captures. Would that be enough for you guys to actually do a full-blown session in the studio? No, not even close. So before you even get started, you know that you've got to free up space on your hard drive or you're done. Next capture adjustments. This I'm going to say leave this at its default. But remember the keyword here. This is not changing your adjustments that have already been made. This is strictly what happens to the next one that you actually shoot. The next one that you shoot here, this ICC profile. I'm just going to leave this at its default. It will go in and it'll look at the metadata and whatever ICC profile it wants to use for a Canon 5D Mark II, or sorry, a Canon 5D Mark IV, which is what shot this image, is what's going to be applied to that. And then for my next shooting, that's also going to be the, 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 the default ICC profile for this. 
the orientation that's again how the image is actually turned now cameras have gotten really good there's gyroscopes that sit in these cameras that establish what down is and so as long as you're shooting like this so if i'm shooting like this or i'm shooting like this whatever it understands the orientation of my camera really well where it screws up is if you're doing this so if i'm shooting straight down what is down there is no down i mean i'm shooting down but when you're talking about the edge of that frame, which of the frame, the top, bottom, right, or left, is supposed to be down? That you call it the photography Indeed, right? So it used to be, unfortunately they don't do this anymore, but it used to be that you could actually change that. If you come up here to the top, it may work for me, but it will not work for you. In the camera drop-down menu at the very top, you have orientation right here, and I can actually change my orientation but I'm betting if you've got a Canon camera, those are all grayed out. Yeah, which sucks. There's no reason it shouldn't be able to support this. But this allowed you to go in and say, if you were shooting straight down and it was like upside down, you could simply go in and change it here. Instead, if that happens, you can't do it here unless you're shooting a face camera, but you can use these rotate buttons. However, if all of you look, I, do you have rotate buttons? No, you don't. So again, hover over this uh, uh, tool panel, hold down your control key, click on your drop down menu, say customize toolbar, and you want to grab the rotating guys right here. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Oh, right here. You want to grab these guys right here and drag it up into your toolbar. And so at the very least, you can sit here with a client and you can actually rotate your images so that they're correct on your screen so that people are not trying to look uh, at shit upside down. Um, metadata, again, the default of the metadata is only going to be your copyright information. And then other styles, we will get to this later because this is how you can embed deeper sets of metadata. So I'm going to collapse copy adjustments. As soon as we get through this, guys, we'll take a break. Overlay, we will talk about later. Capture Pilot. Now, Capture Pilot is actually an interesting thing. This will allow <clears throat> other people in your studio to actually view what's going on on a phone, on a tablet. You can actually download Capture One Pilot software. The applications are free. Again, it's not a full version of Capture One that you're getting on your tablet or that you're getting on your phone. Capture Pilot is strictly you're looking at the, basically you, can, you, you, you see the viewer, you can actually do star ratings and color ratings, and there may be a couple of other things you can do, but, ba but you can't capture, you can't shoot tether to a phone, you can't do any of that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's what Capture Pilot is about. In the big version of Capture One that we're using right here, this is how you would then set up the ad hoc, they call it an ad hoc network, but basically what you're doing is, is that you're creating a network inside of a studio, or you, you can be outside, but in a small area that would be close enough to be Wi-Fi connected to your computer. So you can set this up so, and everybody can join that network and then if they've got the Capture One Pilot um, uh, software on their phone or their tablet, they can then log into that network and they will then be able to view in real time what you're shooting. So the advantage of this is that you can actually have a client that's sitting in some nice conference room watching what you're doing as you're slumming it out in the studio where they have no air conditioning. Make sense? Capture One View Live Beta. Anything that says beta, I get rid of automatically. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm gonna hover over this guy. I'm gonna click and get rid of this tool. So again, I'm gonna get rid of my Capture One Live Beta. I'm also going to get <clears throat> rid of my Capture One Live Pilot because I don't, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to leave Overlay in here. But now there's a couple of other things that I do want to add to this part really quickly because there's other things that we can do here. So to add to this, it used to be that you would control click and it looks like I can still control click down on this space right here. And I'm going to add a tool. And so I'm going to add a number of tools here. So if you guys want to do this with me, that would be great. I'm going to add a black and white tool here really fast. And the reason I do that is that this just really quickly allows me to turn any image into black and white. Now, this image is still a color image, but my preview is showing it in black and white. So if you're shooting for a client that is their ultimately destination is in black and white, 
this gives you the ability to have an art director looking at it in black and white as opposed to looking at it in color and saying, okay, well, don't worry, it's going to be black and white eventually, right? So I'm going to collapse this, though. It's just so I keep it there. I'm going to add another couple of tools underneath this. So I'm going to hover down below this. I'm going to hold down the control key again, click to say add tool. And then as I'm coming down here in the add tool, I'm going to start up here with base characteristics. So pick base characteristics, and what these are, are the thing that's important about this. This is the ICC profile that is being used for this image for us to work on. It's also the one that's going to be used if we develop any files in Capture One. So this profile matters. However, if you click on this, you'll get a drop-down menu, and in the drop-down menu, you can see, in my case right here, this is a set of Canon profiles. It's picking it up from the metadata. But if you come down here to your Canon drop-down menu right here, and then go looking for uh, versions for, this is for a 5D Mark II, Mark IV, you will see that there is more than one profile that you can use for your camp for your uh, uh, your setup right here these are ICC profiles that have been created by phase but you can see the pro standard when I look at the pro standard it's saturating the color more that's basically what it's doing it doesn't look like it's changing exposure but you can see that there's options in this if you actually look at the phase stuff here I'm gonna go back to you can actually apply a different camera company's profile to yours I'm not sure why you would do that but you can do that but anyway I'm gonna go back and take a look at all of the uh, uh, at the um, phase profiles so if we come down to phase one so this is a phase one this is a credo 40 back so that's not gonna be phase it's gonna be leaf where are you? You're right here. This is a leaf, and it's a Credo 40. Look at this. There's no standard ICC profile for this. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I wish they'd quit torturing and killing people out in the studio. You know? Uh, at any rate, it's critical that you guys know this. So this is not next capture adjustment. Remember all of this stuff right here, remember this next capture adjustment, and we said ICC profile was going to be the default. This is how you then go in and change an ICC profile for an image that already exists. So next capture only impacts the next capture that we do. It has no impact on what we already have captured. To change what you have captured, it is base characteristics. Make sense, everyone? We good on this part? We're almost done. Again, I'm hovering in the space below this. Hold down the control. We're going to add another tool. And the one that I think is most critical in this, I will do a couple of them here, but I'm going to do one more here, high dynamic range. High dynamic range, this actually shows you highlight recovery and shadow recovery. That's what these tools are all about. So if we do a warning on this image right now, I'm going to click on exposure warning, and if, I'm going to zip into her shoulder right here you can actually see that this is actually blown out. Remember my highlight warning is showing me where I no longer have detail in this. You can actually visibly watch this and use your shadow recovery to actually pull this up to recover. That's actually going in the other direction. I need to go in this back direction. This is now highlight recovery. Can I recover all the highlights that are on that shoulder? No, I cannot do that. That's the max that I could actually do here. It recovers them somewhat, but not the whole way. So again, this is something that's important to have, especially if you're shooting on white backgrounds and you want to make sure that you're not blowing something completely out. That will actually give you that. And then finally, the last thing that we're going to add here, hold down the control key, click on the drop down menu, and the tool we are going to add here is focus. So with focus, if you actually click, you can see focus is all the way down here at the bottom right now. There is a magnifying glass at the bottom of focus that I can actually drag up and put up here. This focus by default is also set at 100%. And what's most important about this is that the area of the image that we are looking at right here is fully processed. Have we talked about Moray in this class? 
We have in retouching, but not here. Right? So I need to show this to you really quickly, guys. This is the last thing we'll do, and we'll take a break. So give me three minutes of your attention. This is a real screen capture. This is Moray. So what happens in Moray is, is that when you have fabric or basically anything, any, in this case, it's because of the fabric. The weave of this fabric has lines. And those lines are very close in size to the sensor lines because your sensor has also got lines. So your sensor's got row after row after row after row of pixels. When those two things are relatively close to one another in size, they line up like this. If you can take a look at my fingers, they line up, they, they'll cross each other like this. And depending on your angle, these things will change. You guys have probably seen this. You ever watch the news and watch anybody on TV that's wearing a tie and all of a sudden the tie like gets all psychedelic and starts to change its lines? That's more there's two kinds of moray. There's color moray and then there's tonal moray. This is actually tonal moray right here. This is actually happening on this image. However, this is something to know about Capture One. This is critical. Why does Capture One tether so much better and faster? Has anybody in here ever done tethering in Lightroom? Did you ever want to do that ever again? No, it is so slow and it just is so agonizingly slow, right? The reason that happens is because Lightroom fully renders the file. So when you're shooting tethered, for it to show you the preview, it has to process the file in its entirety and then show it to you. That does not happen in Capture One. What Capture One does is that it looks at what your preview is and it only renders the file enough for your preview. But the problem we run into is, is that that means its resolution of your preview is different than the resolution once you develop the file completely out. So this is what I saw on screen, but when I developed this file completely out, this all went away. So that's a good thing, right? But the opposite can happen. You can have a preview that does not show you more ray but that moray actually exists in your raw capture, you will spot that in your focus. So when you do this focus part right here, this completely, rast this renders your file, or it renders just the part that we're looking at. So this part in the window is a fully processed small section of this whole big file. Does that make sense, everybody? So if you've got Moray, it will show up in your focus. If it doesn't show up in here, it will show up in your focus. So in my case, I actually had that, my preview on screen, this big preview looked horrible, but in my focus check right here, it was fine. The thing that you need to worry about though is that what happens when it doesn't show up in your preview, but it will exist in your processed file. This is the place you have to see it. Are we good on this part? All right. So I got 340, a hard 10 back at 350. Let's get it going. We're almost done. Woo! I know. Okay. So, a couple of things left in here that I do want to talk about. <clears throat> oh, that's great. I reset my camera to my default and brought all that shit back. So, really quickly, let me just get rid of a couple of these things. And I'm only going to add a couple of things and then we'll move on. So, I'm going to remove Capture Pilot. And... Capture One Live Beta. I'm going to add Focus. This is the only one I'm going to add just so that we can look at this. 
Okay, so then how do you actually use this part? So the way I know most digital text, the setup that they've got for this is that you really want to be able to see your camera tab and all of this. You really want to be able to see your dedicated focus, but it would also help considerably if you could actually see your library at the same time, because your library is where you control the destination folders that you're working with, the things that you're shooting to. All of this happens here in the library part. So to do this, please do this with me, you can actually tear your library tool tab off so click on the word that says library and simply drag this off. Then click on your camera tab. So this will actually show your tab. We are going to make this a little bit more narrow on my screen. So hang on one second. Let me get this a little bit more narrow. A little bit more narrow here. Again, you would set this all up ahead of time and you can save this as a workspace preset. And then I'm going to come up and I'm going to put my library tab right next to this and then drag it completely out. If you want to do your ratings as well, you can actually add that. You could grab all of your filters and drag and put them over here into your library tab, although it dropped it somewhere else. Sorry. The library tab is over here. We can grab our filters and drag them over here. Or if it doesn't let me drag this over here, that's what it is. I'm just going to control click on this and add. I'm not going to add filters. I'm going to leave my camera part here. So I've got a visible library. I've got a visible camera. And then finally over in here, again, I went back to my default again. I'm going to add focus and I'm going to tear focus off as well and make it bigger so that I actually can see it and then again if you've got the screen real estate you can put it someplace here I mean you can put it underneath here but hopefully if you've got a big monitor that you're working on you can place a, you know you've got a big focus screen but you've still got your whole viewer that's actually happening here Again, this keeps wanting to snap back, so fuck it. I don't have the big monitor here, but do you guys get where I'm going with all of this? So you can see your library, your focus, and your camera controls all on the same screen at the same time, along with your viewer and along with all of your thumbnails. It's how most people I know ultimately work on this. So I'm going to go back to my library on this side. I will grab my library back and bring it back on top of it and let go. It'll put it back into my library. I'm going to go to my camera control right now. We've gotten through our whole camera control. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to go back to my default window. One last thing I want to do, because I do want to show you about shooting into changing the spaces that you're actually going to shoot. So I'm going to go back to my tethered def uh, uh, my, uh, default workspace, just so that everybody's on the same page. I am going to go to my uh, capture folder, but now I want to make subfolders that I can use to separate my images. We already talked about this when we created session favorites last time, didn't we? Why you would do these? Okay, so I'm going to hover over. I'm in the library. I'm going to go to my capture folder. I'm going to hold down the control key, click and say, show this to me in the finder. In the finder, I'm actually going to down here in the finder. I'm going to do, I'm just going to put in uh, uh, new folders in here. So uh, option command N will actually create a new folder or go up to your file menu and come down and say new folder. And I'm going to name this new folder 01. And then I'm going to create another folder in here. And I'm going to call it 02. And I'm going to create another one in here.
and call it 03. And then if we go take a look at the very top, I will have 01, 02, and 03 right here. I'm going to select all of those and I'm going to drag these on top of my session favorites and let go. So now I've got one, two, and three. So I want to shoot to one, two, and three. Again, I'm gonna change because I've reset my default. I need to check and look at my capture naming in here. So in my capture naming, it was sticky. So remember, I set up this capture naming to do the name of my session plus the destination folder plus the three digit counter. That's what I wanna work on right now. Again, capture right now is my current folder. So I'm gonna change this in my library, this again is why people keep their libraries um, um, uh, visible, but I'm gonna go back to my library right here. I'm gonna hover over my O1 right here. I'm gonna hold down my control key, click. I'll get a drop down menu and I'm gonna say, set this as my capture folder. You can see it puts a little camera right next to it. It's no longer going to shoot files into my capture folder. It's going to shoot it into this O1 folder right here. If we go back to our uh, uh, camera setting uh, 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 tool tab and come down and say destination folder, you can see right here that the color, the sample that I've got for this has changed my file naming to include that 01. But you'll also notice that it's setting up capture one to shoot frame number 31. It inherits the frame counter from whatever we've been doing. I want to start over again. I want this. This is going to be a completely different shooting for me. Again, I use my 01, 02, 03, 04. As a fashion shooter, those are outfits that I'm shooting. I'm not doing this. It's not frame counting. It's the shooting that I'm doing. So I've got the jacket and white pants are my first one. And then the denim is my second shot. I mean, whatever. That's what's basically going on in here. So you need to reset this counter. So I'm going to come up to my uh, uh, um, uh, the three dots across from the capture naming. I'm gonna click on that drop down menu and I'm gonna say reset my capture counter and you'll see now I'm starting at frame zero one. So I'm gonna turn on my camera and I'm going to focus it on something and I'm going to shoot a frame and see what ends up happening. <clears throat> so it's saying it can't show me anything right here. I am selecting on my capture folder. It's actually showing it to me here but I have zero exposure here because again, I, I mean, I've got, it, it did a capture, but I don't have enough light in here. So I'm going to radically open up this camera. I was at uh, F9 at 125th. So I'm gonna go to uh, half a second, all the way open. You guys just need to get an exposure. I don't care what you do, get an exposure. I'll do a quarter of a second. And now I actually do have an image. So, and again, I'm not worried about focus here. I'm not worried about anything else here, whatever. I'm just gonna shoot another couple of frames around here. So just shoot a few frames here for me, if you will. You need to get something that we've actually done in here. So shoot a few frames, make sure that it's actually doing the naming <clears throat> that you expect it to do. Cause again, you'll see 001, 03. So this is actually giving me exactly what I want. You'll notice I don't have any of my original images in here. And the reason I don't have any of my original images in here is that they're all in the parent folder. They're all in, not this capture folder. Again, this capture folder right here is referring to my session favorite that's called folder 01. So if I click on 01 and hold down my control key and say, show me this in the finder, it's gonna show me inside of my capture folder, I've got this frame 01, and these are where all my captures are. The ones that I'm shooting right now are all sitting right in here. Does this make sense everybody what's going on? Okay, I'm gonna go back into my uh, 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 um, uh, uh, capture one. I'm going to go to my library again. And this time I'm going to change. I'm going to hover over O2. I'm going to click on O2, hold down my control key, click on the drop down menu and say, I want you to set two now as my capture folder. So now I'm moving on to my second shot. Does that make sense everybody what I'm doing here? 
I'm going to my second shot right here. You can see the little camera icon is next to that. I don't have any images yet because I haven't shot anything. But before you do your first frame, you need to look at the naming. Because again, if we go back to the camera counter and take a look at the naming, you can see it's ready to start at frame number six. It remembers the first five frames that I shot in a previous session. So I don't want this to start at frame number six. I need it to start over again. So I'm up to the uh, three digit lines across from this and I'm gonna come, sorry, in my capture naming the little three digits and reset my capture counter. And then I'm going to start shooting again. So I'm gonna do one frame here and then another frame here and then another frame here and then another frame here but then the art director comes in and says to me, well, Verser, I need to shoot more of the, your first shot. You were using the wrong hair, the wrong shoes. You can't actually do that. We need to add to that. So I'm going to say, okay, that's fine. We can add to this. So I'm going to go back to my library. I'm going to go back to my session favorite 01 to my subfolder 01. Hold down the control key, click on my drop down menu and say, set this as my capture folder. But look, I've got frame number five was the last one that I did. But if I go back now to my next capture naming session, it also wants to pick up at frame number five. If I shoot this, it's going to overwrite the frame number five that I already did. I can't have that happen. So instead, I'm going to click on the little three dots for the naming drop down menu and say set capture counter and I'm gonna put in a six here instead so that I don't lose the frame number five that I've already done and I'm actually starting with the correct naming with number six. And so then I can actually click and continue on. Does this make sense to everybody what's going on? Did that work for everyone? Okay, finally, the last thing I wanna show you, <clears throat> completely different program. All of you guys are consumed with shooting to external hard drives, with backing up, with having all of that stuff happen, right? So when do you actually back up? When you guys shoot, when do you back up? Most of you wait until the very end of your shooting to actually back up. So let's say you've been shooting all day long. For a typical shooting day for me, it's 15 images, right? So I'm finishing up frame number 15 and all of a sudden my computer crashes and I lose everything, I lose the whole day. Is that how you wanna work? So when would you back up? I'm sorry? So what a lot of people will do is they'll start to actually do backup during breaks. When people are changing outfits, they'll do it then. Some people wait and they do it like at lunch and then they'll do it again at the end of the day. So if you do it at lunch and then at the end of the day, if your computer completely goes down, you only lose half a day instead of a full day. Does that sort of make sense what's going on there? However, there is software that you guys, I'm just gonna put it out there right now, you need to buy and you need to use. And it all has to do with your backup routines. And so we're gonna look at that really quickly right now. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm just gonna show you this program really fast. Let's take it, let's do this, let's do this. It's been a long software day. We're gonna stop right now. We're gonna to get to backup later. Cause I feel like I've gotten everything and then some out of you guys. Um, and I don't want this to fall on deaf ears. So um, let's call it a day right now. Uh, I did, Chronosync was still on my list and I certainly will demo it to you guys, uh, but um, we're gonna end it here. So I need uh, everybody, are, are there questions about anything we've gone through today so far? We did what? Well, that's what I asked you guys, and nobody seemed to remember doing catalogs. Did you? What the fucking good does a little bit of knowing do? I need you guys. Okay, nobody's taking this seriously. I need, I'm trying to tell you guys right now. How many of you guys are graduating in a month? How many of you are terrified of getting a job? How many of you, when I said to you, if you command this program, if you learn this program better than anybody else in the world knows it, I can guarantee you a job in any fucking major city in the world. How many of you didn't think I was, how many thought I was lying about that? 
I am trying to give you guys a career. That's what I'm trying to do. It is not certification. That is a two-day intensive thing that, yeah, that costs, oh, the last time I did it was three or $400 to do it. Oh, yeah, it's a plane ticket, but it's also your name on that list of certified professionals who can actually digital tech. There's no photographer I know who will go to a foreign city and hire from anybody who's not on that list. I'm going to stop the recording right now. We can talk about this, but I just want to hang on one second. I, I, we don't need to add this.